Right, we have our Z local system. Um, on that level, the filtration is not defined, but we can look at V sub O. Which would be an analytic vector bundle. Over S, we're literally at every point, we just allow the sort of local system V and we allow coefficients that are analytic functions. So it'll give us a analytic vector bundle. And on this level, we have our Hodge filtration. So there's a filtration of this by analytic vector bundles ending with F2N. Which now at every point will give us our, our heart structure. Sort of the, um, formalize this. And now, by the way, even though we're primarily interested in variations of heart structure, which come from geometric origin, that's sort of the motivation for studying them, we can study them more generally if we like. We can forget about X over S. Um, and just talk about sort of abstract variation of heart structures, which consist of this data. You have this V, uh, this local system, you have this filtration, once it tends through with O, and you can put in some conditions, and that'll be a, a variation of heart structures. <clears throat> okay, but let's, let's stick to the geometric picture for now. <clears throat> so we can define the Hodge locus. Literally be the locus in S. Let's say points, uh, let's call them little s, such that if you look at V sub S as a hard structure, this admits non trivial hard vectors. Defined last time. So let me just uh, recall for you what that is. So it's all S and S such that if we look at the fiber, uh, the integral fiber at S, and we intersect with the middle piece here, let us admit something. It's not just a zero set. We define this in terms of the decomposition. We define it to be an integer vector, which is in the n n piece. But because this is integer, therefore real, is the same as this being in the middle of filtration piece. Because if you're in the middle of filtration piece, you're also in the conjugate of it. And their intersection is just the f n n piece. So you can define it um, on this level. <clears throat> OK, so. Um, observations about this set. So first of all, if you look at the set, everything here, this here is analytic. This is discrete, it's countable. That's a, just a lattice. So this is locally a countable union of analytic sets. That's the first observation. And the second observation is if we assume the Hodge conjecture, which is kind of a big motivation for this whole story to begin with, then what are uh, the vectors in here? Where are they coming from? Well, they're coming from certain algebraic cycles that exist in the fibers. And so this is really like, you can define this all algebraically. You can look at some Chow variety and you know set of all cycles and ask for there to exist some cycle blah 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 with some cohomology class. So it can always define algebraically. Then if you assume the Hodge conjecture, then in fact this is a countable union of algebraic varieties. 
Oh, sorry, of, of, uh, yeah, of algebraic. Now this countable is a little bit annoying. We can refine it a little bit to get finite. And where is this countable coming from? Well, this countable is coming from the fact that if you're looking for algebraic cycles, they can have arbitrary degree basically. And the degree can be any positive integer. So define degree a little bit carefully, whatever. But that's basically where it's coming from. So we can stratify a little bit more. We can define Hodge N inside Hodge to be the set of S such that there exists some vector V it's not zero in this intersection we talked about. And let's bound the complexity of V. So we're in even uh, dimension because we're looking for cycles. They're always even real dimension. Even they, could be, they could be odd complex dimension. <clears throat> let's insist The Hodge form on them, which is the same as QVV, our polarization form, is less than or equal to some integer n. Sorry, I shouldn't have used n here. Right. Yes. <laughs> my notes have it right. My brain just doesn't. Um, so we can stratify by these guys. And then we should get a locally finite union. Um, and so uh, the theorem, the theorem of tiny the living cup n. And um, I should include Schmidt's name here because his work is all over the place. It's have to use. <clears throat> that proves this unconditional. Look at Hodge M. In fact, that this is uh, algebraic, period. And therefore, this is a countable union of algebraic varieties w without assuming the Hodge. So in some ways, this is the best evidence we have towards the Hodge conjecture. I mean, there's other things as well, I guess, but it's considered to be a pretty good point. <clears throat> Even though the Hodge conjecture is perhaps not all that believed, as I said earlier, um, you still have this, this claim here. Um, okay, so what I want to do <clears throat> is I want to explain a, a proof of this, a pretty quick proof using the statement that period maps are definable. Um, so first, let me explain a proof in the compact case. Again, one way, I mean, perhaps not always, but often a way you can think about minimality is as a substitute uh, for compactness. So in the compact case, a lot of this stuff is often a lot easier to get. So this is S, comp S is compact? Yes, we're going to assume that S is compact, exactly. Too much is compact. <clears throat> okay, if it's compact, then this height locus, the stratified piece of it, but it's integer m, is a locally finite. Uh, well, sorry, so it's just locally an analytic set. Locally a finite union of analytic sets, and therefore it's an analytic set. Sorry, this is not therefore. Hot m is locally analytic, period. Now, if S is compact, then being locally analytic means you're globally um, analytic. There's no funny difference. And then, because you're compact, uh, this is crucial using S is compact and Gaga, or the Chow, the classical Chow theorem. Why is the Todd Jam is algebraic? Okay. 
there's an analytic set, a globally analytic set of an algebraic variety, has to be odd. Okay, so um, the way Kifani, Delin, and Kaplan uh, proved their theorem in the general setting, and again, you can see here that it's really all about these generations, like so many questions about hard structures. The hard part is when your base is not compact and your hard structure sort of degenerates to infinity. And the sort of classical cases of elliptic curves degenerating, which perhaps people are more familiar with, and then there's more complicated ways in which algebraic varieties are more fundamentally there corresponding hard structures you generate. <clears throat> um, so let me explain how if we have this definability statement for period maps, we can prove this quite quickly. Ability of period maps. And again, definability here is an RNX, which in applications is always what it is for this whole subject, as far as I know, so far. Okay, I want to stress also that, again, we're not, uh, we're giving a simpler proof than Kitani and Kaplan, but it, it, it's not like fundamentally this is avoiding the complicated analytic estimates that go into the foundation of Hodge, of Hodge theory, particularly the work of Schmidt. That's just baked into this proof that period maps are definable. So very much we're still relying on that classical work. <clears throat> um, I'll go even further to say that like, I'll say a bit more about this later, but fundamentally the proof starts from Schmidt's proof of the one dimensional case. And that's a really complicated piece of work that I still don't fully understand. Um, so we, we, we definitely uh, are relying on that. Okay, so given this family here, we can look at um, the variation of hard structures. And as we discussed, we can get this period map to an appropriate period space, B mod GC. And now the point is the hard locus only cares about the, the hard structure. Therefore, it can be defined entirely on this side. So we can study what it is just over here. So we have some universal project tilde, which is GZ invariant. But I can even think about it inside D. This is a set of all abstract um, hard structures such that there exists some non zero Hodge vector. No, this is like a universal Hodge. Atom. This has nothing to do with the, with the phi. Oh. Um, so, this is some set in D, which will of just like Hodge structures where there exists some non zero Hodge vector. Um, and then it descends down here, it's GZ invariant. And then Hodge M on S will be the pre image of this guy because it's all points with the corresponding Hodge structure has some non zero Hodge vector. <clears throat> and I can ask what this looks like. Um, and it turns out um, that what this is is a union of group orbits. Where H, what is this group H? H is a stabilizer inside G of some vector V. <clears throat> so essentially, if you start with a point with a Hodge vector, let's call it V, and you want to get other ones, well, one way you can do that is you can act by the stabilizer V. Remember, the action is on the filtrations. So if you're inside the end filtered piece and you act by something which doesn't change V, you're gonna stay inside the end filtered piece. So you can get them. And, and it turns out they're all uh, of this form. So just a count of of group orbit. This is just a fact about Grossmannian. There's nothing super complicated here. This is extremely, you know, it's just, it's just linear algebra. And the simple linear algebra, not the messy stuff that goes into Hodge theory. So then if you look at, 
uh, its image inside D mod GZ It turns out this is a finite union of the sets of the form HR mod HZ mod some compact K sub H. So basically, of other things of this kind of shape. In fact, of the other period domains. <clears throat> So in particular, we can describe this all with basically Ziegel sets. So this here is definable, not just in R and X, but in fact in RL. Just write it down as some orbitals and semi-simple groups. It's not, it's, it's, you know, very straightforward. <clears throat> okay, so now you plug in the big piece of input, which is that this period map is definable inside R and X. In field, definable once you increase your structure to R and X, it follows that phi inverse. Follows it Hodge M, which we defined over there, which is just the inverse of this set here. It's also definable in R and X. Okay, but now you have an analytic set which is definable in R and X, so now you can apply the definable chart here. Um, here's that Ferchenko instead of the regular chart here that we're using the compact case. Did you say that uh, some is still dependent on something that's weak? So the, the, the fact that phi is definable depends very strongly on, on Schmidt's work. Oh, okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. But once you have that as input, you can sort of forget about it. Um, yeah, in fact, this statement sort of depends on Schmidt's work and you can recover at least the vast majority of Schmidt's estimates just from this statement. We just unfold what it means. It's, it's a lot of what Schmidt did. <clears throat> Okay, so I want to emphasize the step, which is, uh, which I really like, which I think is very pretty, that uh, D mod GZ has no algebraic structure, so like for real. Now that we can't prove it, it just doesn't exist uh, in pretty strong terms. Um, and so you can't apply any definable job groups here. You sort of can't hope to, but it has, it's this weird situation where you have this non algebraic um, complex manifold or definable complex manifold monthly. Talk about that, um, which receives a lot of maps from actual algebraic varieties. And so, even though you can't apply definable job here, you can sort of set the groundwork for it. You can prove a bunch of things here definable. And then, once you pull them back to algebraic varieties, then you can apply all sorts of algebraization theorems. And so, in preparation for applying those theorems and varieties, you can sort of focus over here. Um, questions about? This whole picture. Okay, I should mention also that like the proof of Cantani the even Kaplan. When they like similar lines, they should have to work harder because they didn't have this framework. Um, their proof ultimately was still to study the set Hodge set Hodge sub M, and to use uh, the asymptotics of period maps in sort of really clever ways to prove that its extension to a compactification of S is also algebraic. Um, and then they applied regular Gaga on the compactification. But to do that, they sort of had to really get into the weeds of the analyticity. Uh, and that sort of whole step becomes a lot simpler once you just have the language of O-minimality. Mm. 
Okay. <clears throat> so let me talk a little bit about um, how to decompose arbitrary S's into sort of manageable pieces on which we can study questions like finability, for example. Uh, I, I talked about this briefly last time. <clears throat> But so in general, uh, given the smooth algebraic variety, complex variety, yes, we say that S bar is a log smooth compactification. If it's sort of a very simple compactification analytically, meaning that around every point is sort of look as simple as possible. So what does that mean? So if locally on S bar, S looks like the complement of um, hyperplane axes. So essentially, if we take a point P in S bar, then you can find an open set U inside S bar, <clears throat> such that you can sort of um, you can map you homomorphically to some V sitting in affine space, C to the K. <clears throat> and uh, U intersect S will map to V minus the union of V intersect some coordinates being zero. Okay, where the x are the standard coordinates and see the here. So if you're at a point in S, this don't remove anything, and look, you just open set. Um, and then a classic example to think of is if S is an open curve, like an open Riemann surface, and S bar is this compactification, is like a compact. Uh, Riemann surface, then at the point you're adding, locally you look like C minus sort of a single point. So S bar is also an algebraic variety? Yes, 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 yes. This is also, this is a pretty, this is a compact algebraic variety. Okay. Mm -hmm. Essentially, the, the motivation for doing this is um, we want to break up S into sort of Finitely many simple chunks on which we can study finability. We need finitely many because we're doing well, yeah, logic. <laughs> um, and so it's not enough to work with uh, just locally on S. You have to go to compactification and work sort of locally on S bar. Well, it's a log smooth pair. Uh, why is it log? Yeah. Um, that's, a, that's a good question. I don't know the history super well. The, the one thing that you end up doing a lot, which we might talk about, is um, to study uh, differential forms on S. You study differential forms on S bar, which are allowed to have a simple pole along the complement divisor. So, that's sort of where the law comes from, it's from things like dx over x. Um, I don't know the exact history for it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's a good question. We call this D, which is the complement of S bar of S and S bar. 
<clears throat> called a normal crossing supervisor. Wait, what D looks like is it's basically a bunch of smooth uh, varieties, uh, sort of co-dimension one, which can intersect along co-dimension two sets in like transverse ways, and they can intersect furtherly transverse along co-dimension three sets and so forth. So it's locally like an intersection of these kinds of uh, coordinate axes. <clears throat> um, yeah, just to give um, a couple of examples in dimension one, sort of locally, um, this, if you look at the locally for P in S bar, that's not S, um, D is just this point. And so um, you get a, you get, a, if you take a U, a U and P, which is homeomorphic to the disk, um, then U intersect S, which is homeomorphic to the puncture disk. And so your basic object becomes the disk together with the puncture disk. <clears throat> and an example of this that sort of concretely happens and shows up is if you look at the modular curve, in which you have your variations of elliptic curves, this sits inside. A compactified modular curve, which a variation of hard structures doesn't extend. So, if you want to study definability, you have to study it inside, which is just studying it on disks. That's the easy case. And the hard case is figuring out what happens around the cusp, which is why where sort of this model comes into play. And then uh, in dimension two, the sort of simplest case to think about is just square the previous example y1 squared and x1 squared. And then your basic models become the disk squared, the disk cross the puncture disk, or the puncture disk squared. And of course, you have examples that don't just come from dimension one case, um, dimension at least two x. You can also look at like AG sitting inside some toroidal compactification of AG or something. So now it's a it's a complicated sort of picture algebraically. You don't know exactly what's or it's hard to say exactly what's happening, but you always locally your model looks like delta to the m plus delta star to the m prime. Okay, so then essentially in general, you can for any s you can take a log smooth compactification, and then by working uh, s bar, and by working locally on s bar you can break up S into finitely many pieces uh, that look like this. And this is sort of the basic object on which you study variations of hard structure, both in terms of definability and uh, estimates and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so let's um, zoom back a little bit and talk about periods. So as mentioned uh, at the very beginning, the way you construct these hard structures fundamentally is from these more basic objects uh, that are periods. You take a sort of integral basis for homology, you take a base of differential forms, uh, you study these integrals in families and you record only certain data which gives you the hard structure. Uh, but right now, let's let's zoom out and instead of studying the hard structure, just go back to studying periods, partly because they're more concrete and sort of easier to work with, and partly because we get slightly more general results. And it's, I think, kind of visual. So again, let's go back to this picture, um, x over s. 
<clears throat> and now what we're going to do is we're going to fix in um, algebraic variation of holomorphic n-forms. So something like this. So basically, uh, if I didn't, didn't have the over S here, I would record a full holomorphic n-form on X, but I really only care about what it is on fibers. I don't care how this n-form looks in the directions that are not contained inside fibers, because all I'm gonna be doing with omega is integrating it along the cycles and fibers. And so I just have this, these relative forms here. So if I have coordinates Z here and Z and W here, I only want this omega to care about dw, not to care about dz. <clears throat> okay, and now let me look at a point, s not an s, to sort of base myself around. And uh, an n cycle in the homology. Then given this n cycle, because my family is sort of smooth, uh, it's locally trivial. So I can take the cycle and I can continue it to a cycle on all the other fibers. The only issue being monodrome. So now if I study integral, so let me, let me say it this way, I can continue omega to omega s for little s in s, up to monodrome. And what I can do is I can consider this period function integral of omega over uh, gamma s over gamma s. And I can ask, is this the final? Or, you know, I can ask all the questions about it. But is it definable? <clears throat> okay, so what, is, what does that mean? We have a multi valued function here. So, what does it mean for it to be definable? Well, there's several ways. to make the question precise. <clears throat> One way, let's say S is um, a curve for the moment. Let's say it's even a projective curve, it doesn't really matter. So One thing you can do is you can just take branch cuts. Um, I don't know. Sorry, it shouldn't all be dotted, I guess. This is thick, this is thick. Um, then I can look at this, change colors here. Clearly, I'm not a topologist. Uh, is that enough? What's the, what's the cohomology of a genus 2 curve? Like H4. So I'm missing a cycle somewhere. Oh, this cycle here. Yeah. Maybe that's good. Okay, whatever. You take some branch cuts of this thing such that you get no monodromy. I need one more. <laughs> need one more. Here it is. No, I don't need one. Oh, whatever. Okay, cut it on a bunch. These branch cuts continue outside of the branch cuts. Uh, you get some function. It doesn't, it's not like smooth across these, but whatever. It's still the definable structure and you can ask, are you definable um, on this set over here? <clears throat> so essentially, can ask, are you definable after branch cuts? Now, in principle, it could depend on which branch cut it takes, but the answer is going to be yes, no matter which one. So, you know, uh, we're not going to spread that point um, too much. <clears throat> 
Okay, so again, to, to understand this question, um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna study it locally. So we're gonna fix an S inside S bar, as we've been saying. And I'm gonna write S as a union, a finite union of neighborhoods B sub I for each B I is isomorphic to some delta star to the M I cross delta to the M I prime. And uh, for simplicity, we start with just the star. In the general case behaves very similarly. So let's just pretend S is a curve and we're working inside uh, S is an open curve. We compactify it by adding some points. Finally, any points, let's work in a neighborhood of one of those points. So importantly, the fundamental group of this punctured disk is just Z. <clears throat> and so the only monodromy we have is the action of um, a single, uh, a single. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> now, how uh, can we talk about definability on delta star? Well, we can do this uh, branch cut thing uh, once again. It turns out a slightly nicer thing you can do is the following. Once you're down to an actual disk, what you can do is you can look at its universal cover in the form of the upper half plane, where the map here is Z, P of Z, and the two pi I Z. And this is a universal cover where the monodromy of this is the integers here, it's just Z. And then what you can do is you can look at the fundamental domain. It's just a vertical strip in the upper half plane. In the upper half plane, call this f. And then um, if you have a function on delta star, we'll define it to monodromy. You can pull it back and get an actual function. The strip, and then you can ask, is it definable on here? The question is integral findable on F. I want, I want to mention a, a subtlety here. Um, normally on the upper half plane, as you approach the sort of x-axis, things get kind of crazy and, and analytically interesting and subtle. That's not the case here, because if we just shrink the disk a little, we raise our, um, we raise our base. Right? So we really care about being definable, like starting from some height. So the only subtlety is uh, as we go up towards infinity. That's the sort of only point we have to worry about. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> okay, some examples. Of the kind of functions um, that you see uh, showing up. So what, what does the setup uh, sort of look like? <clears throat> I'm going to be a little loose with my examples, just to get familiar functions. I'm going to let my family x not be quite as smooth projective as we've been doing, but in principle, uh, these are the same kind of phenomena. So one thing you can do is you can look at a family of constant GMs over a base GM. Let me give the, um, the uh, coordinates x here 
x here and y here. So I can look at this family. And then what I can do is over y in the base, oh, sorry, over x in the base, what I can do is identify the points one and x. So in general, you gotta be careful when identifying things in varieties. If you have curves, you're identifying points, it's okay. You get a little curve. This is a GM, and you're sort of pinching it by identifying uh, one and X. You get a slightly singular curve. <clears throat> um, and sort of, if you identify that, you get a map to one X, which maps to GM where the fibers now are these GMs with points identified. <clears throat> okay, so now this creates an extra loop gamma. So if you look at each one of just GM, that's already a Z. And if you look at this H1 of GM with one identified with X, that's going to be a z squared. And then the action of monodromy on here, sort of as you go around the base over here, around its loop, you get a monodromy action on homology. And what it does is it fixes this loop. This loop's canonical. And on the other loop, it acts um, unipotent. So you have the action of monodromy on here. And this looks like sort of Let's call this Z times um, our fixed loop T or something. So the way this works is gamma goes to gamma plus T. That's the action of our monodromy. Now, finally, we can take the differential form um, omega to just be dy over y, which is the constant differential form as we vary. And now what are we doing if we're integrating into long gamma? We're just integrating dy over y from one to t to, uh, to, to x. Um, so the integral of omega here is just the integral dy over y from one to x. And that's just log x. Using the setup, you can get log x um, as a period. And of course, you know, this monodromy explains log x multi value. That's how that happens. So that's kind of a classical example. Again, I'm, I'm cheating a little bit in making this example because my family likes to protect my family. But I want to convey the sort of kinds of functions you get as principles. As, as periods, excuse me. And the second example that I want to give is uh, this family of um, elliptic curves. So let's consider the universal elliptic curve over Y1. So how do we do, we do this? Well, we can look at um, we can look at C cross H over H over the full upper half plane. Let's say this is the coordinates of Z and tau. And then what we can do is we can map the universal uh, elliptic curve. Uh, over the upper half plane, and this is just CZ mod one comma tau at every point. It'll give you an elliptic curve. This tau varies. You get a family of elliptic curves over the upper half plane. <clears throat> and then, what is the action of ABCD? Sends a point z comma tau, well, tau goes to a tau plus b. 
over C tau plus B plus D. Z just scales. And then if you quotient now by this action, you get the universal loop differential over by one. <clears throat> then we're trying to make a relative uh, one form. So a natural guess would be dz, but dz is not invariant. The group action is ended to dz divided by c tau plus d. So we got to fix that. We got to sort of multiply it by something in tau, which will cancel out this transformation. And one way to do that, you can let omega be not dz, but dz divided by the square root, for example, of j prime of tau. There's lots of ways to do it, but this is one way of doing it. So j is invariant. So if you differentiate it, it's going to be sort of modular for a2, blah, 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 you work it out. This transformation gets canceled. <clears throat> right? Um, cool. This is a relative one form. Okay. okay, now experience are very easy to figure out because we're just integrating this along one and tau. So the periods are given by one over root j prime tau and tau over root j prime tau. And they're um, linear combinations, if you look sort of integer linear combinations, which is the one. <clears throat> and so the periods being definable amounts to both of these being definable in a fundamental set, which you have because j is defined. For J, J primes. Once you have J definable, so the J. Okay, this is the kind of stuff you have. All right, so now I want to prove that in general, these periods are definable. Um, uh, I forget how so the schedule is supposed to work. Um, why don't we take a five minute break now, I guess. But, is that good? I don't know. Okay, <laughs> let's come back at, at that's like uh, 11 after I guess. <clears throat> okay. Is that real for the speech? Yes. Oh. Yes. Uh. Thank <laughs> you. 
Huh? Here, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm <laughs> question of periods being definable. <clears throat> so um, I should mention that this, well, this periods are definable business is um, part of this nice paper of, uh, of Ben Baker and Kapilani, where they 
uh, phrase it in the language of sort of definable analytic schemes that we're going to explore a little bit. Ventures. <clears throat> but let's take to this concrete question right now. So again, we want to understand um, these functions integral gamma uh, of, of this omega. <clears throat> so it turns out that because of monodromia, instead of studying them one at a time, it sort of makes sense to study all the gammas uh, at once because the monodromy sort of switches between them all anyways. <clears throat> so um, let's recall the action of monodromy. So if you look at um, Vs naught for some S naught, some base point S naught. In our punctured disk, and we call it gamma sits um, um, inside here. <clears throat> so, for example, the gamma is now with the VS naught. Then, what we end up getting from monodromy is an action T on VS naught. Just by sort of taking the homology cycle moving around the loop and seeing which other homology cycle uh, we end up with. <clears throat> and we can integrate um, our, our different reform omega against any cycle inside VS naught. And so we can get F of omega as a global section <clears throat> of the dual here. Well, at least at, um, at S, at S not. Let me say it this way, sorry, I apologize. So let's call F S not omega to be an element of the dual space uh, such that F S not omega applied to gamma by definition is just the integral of omega along gamma. So we have an action um, of this dual space here. And now we can extend f to a function on the entire puncture disk up to monodromy. <clears throat> and then we're going to record that is we're actually going to pull it back um, to the upper half plane using discovery here. <clears throat> so we can pull f s not omega back to the upper half plane, where it's simply connected. So we get a function full function f sub z omega, which is a global section on the pullback of this vector bundle v <clears throat> uh, on the upper half plane. Of the dual. And how is the action of monodromy um, recorded? Well, it's precisely by saying what happens when you go around the loop. That's just adding one to z. So f sub z plus one of omega is f of omega acted on by our operators. <clears throat> Okay. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to modify it slightly um, such that we can get a well defined function on our actual puncture disk. And the way we do this is as follows. So first we're gonna write T as um, E of N for some N. <clears throat> um, so E to the two pi I. Some operator N. <clears throat> and now what we're gonna do is we're going to study, so consider, 
we call it G of Z, which will be the following, it would be E minus um, NZ applied to um, FZ of omega. So the point of doing this, we're sort of untwisting the action of monodromy on here. So if you look at G of Z plus one, what do you get? You get E of minus NZ plus one. So E of minus NZ followed by E of minus N. You get F of Z plus one omega, which is just T of Z omega. And then by construction, these two sort of cancel out. And so you just get E of minus NZ F Z omega, which is just G of Z. You do the sort of twisting trick, as a result, G becomes invariant under adding one. Therefore, G of Z descends to a section on delta star. Okay. Whoops. Okay, so you have this uh, different section G of Z, which is now a global holomorphic function of delta stars. So that's pretty good. But we changed it by this E of minus and Z. So what does this E of um, minus and Z look like? <clears throat> well, use Jordan Holder in general, separate N into its uh, semi-simple and unipolar part. So NS is semi-simple, so diagonalizable. And U is unipotent, and they commute. I'm writing this way. <clears throat> and then E of N is just E of NS, or well, let me, let me put the Z in. E of NZ is E of NSZ times E of NS, that E of NUZ. Okay, now what do these two functions look like? Well, exponentiating a unipotent uh, matrix is just a polynomial function. This is literally polynomial Z. This is a very well-controlled function. It's small and certainly definable and whatever you like. <clears throat> now, what about this guy? Well, NS here is um, diagonalizable. So this uh, has components. If you look at its uh, function as its matrix in an appropriate uh, basis, an eigenbasis looks like E of lambda Z, where lambda are the eigenvalues. of ns, right? So we call this as e to the power of 2 pi i lambda z. <clears throat> and so expanding this out a bit further, z is x plus i y, we get e to the minus 2 pi i lambda x times e to the power of, um, sorry, 2 pi i lambda x times e of minus 2 pi then the way. Now, the x part is fine because x is in the compact interval. So any analytic function of x is, is, is okay. It's, it's y that's going to infinity along a vertical strip. And so we want this function to be, um, <clears throat> excuse me, to be well behaved. And when that's gonna happen, so this is well behaved. If lambda is 
If or not? Not real motion. Findable. Moves around on the route. <clears throat> Okay, and now what does it mean for the eigenvalues of n to be real, where the eigenvalues of t are just e to the power of 2 pi i times the eigenvalues of n? This exactly means that the eigenvalues of t are norm 1. So if monodromy me acts via normal eigenvalues, um, you can do this construction and this function E of NZ that you're twisting by um, is definable on your fundamental set that you care about. <clears throat> okay, now let's look at our function G of Z. Now, G of Z is well-defined On delta star. <clears throat> Let's let Q be E of Z, the coordinate on our delta star. Moreover, uh, G of Z, or let's call it G of Q now, because it's a, a well defined function on delta star. G of Q is holomorphic on delta star, and it's also of polynomial growth. Polynomial with monitor Q as Q approaches zero. Why is it of polynomial growth? Well, let's see. What are the components uh, of G of Z? First of all, we had this F sub Z of omega. For growth, we could just take a branch cut. It's not going to change anything. What is F sub Z of omega? It's just the integral of an algebraic differential form along subcycle. That algebraic differential form itself has moderate growth because it's algebraic. So it grows at most like one over Q to the power of something. Um, your cycle is compact. So the integration is not gonna add more growth. And so that part's fine. <clears throat> and what about this E to the minus E of minus N Z? Well, you can see how fast that grows. It grows like E to the minus two pi I uh, lambda Y. So it's some, polynomial with e to the y, which is 1 over q. So this function as you go to 0 grows like a polynomial with 1 over q. Therefore, g is meromorphic near 0 um, on, on delta. <clears throat> OK, so it doesn't have any sort of singularity. This part, by the way, well, this part would be, this part doesn't rely on the fact that you have norm one eigenvalues. This is just true, right? If lambda is, is, is not real, then yes, you wind around, you won't be definable, but it's not gonna make your absolute value go to go haywire. Okay, as we'll see in a second, that's kind of a, that never comes up, but still. Okay, so we're in good shape. In order to get that our periods um, are definable, all we have to check now of to verify is that these eigenvalues really are uh, of norm one. Once we have that, this argument's finished because, yeah, because FCW is going to be, this G is meromorphic, therefore definable, and G and F are only off by this thing, which is definable if you have norm one eigenvalues. Okay, so now fact, a simple um, <clears throat> theory is that for variations of hot structure, let me just this up. 
Automotivity applies to an arbitrary local system, which is the generality in which uh, Baker and Bulani work. But variation of heart structure, in particular, that includes this sort of relative smooth projective family case uh, we've been dealing with. <clears throat> this operator T that we've been studying is quasi unicorn. i.e. its eigenvalues are roots of field. In fact, it's even better. It means you can pass to a finite cover such that all the eigenvalues of T aren't just quasi-unipotent, they're actually unipotent. Hmm. Okay. Um, and so uh, that concludes this theorem. <clears throat> the roof of this. Any questions about this part? <clears throat> okay. you'll, you'll notice this doesn't rely on any period now to be a self contained study up, up to the side. Uh, this is a very tedious It's quasi. <clears throat> no, by the way, this trick. Of untwisting the sort of monodromy applies very generally. It applies to periods. So, in particular, it also applies to um, hard structures, to, to period maps, excuse me. So, as far as the strip is concerned, we have our period map um, from S. So, in particular, that's restricted to delta star. Mapping to D mod Z. Now, we'd like to um, uh, get something just of delta star mapping to D, but we can't because of monodromy. If we pull back to the upper half plane, and we call the composite map C, then what we'll have um, is that C lifts to some C tilde in the upper half plane to D because the upper half plane is simply connected. So you could just lift the universal cover. And what this will satisfy that C tilde of Z plus one is equal to this very same thing, T acting on C tilde of Z. Where now you're acting on the heart structure, which the heart structure is built out of periods. So once you know how you act on the period, you act in the same way on this sort of Grassmannian thing built out of the periods. <clears throat> so what you can do is you can twist now. So you can instead consider a function g of z defined in the exact same way. With a twist by the steel minus mg. Now g becomes a function of the upper half plane, not to d anymore. Now you're going to go all the way to the check. Because um, if you're acting by complex uh, matrices, there's no reason for you to stay inside D. The real points act in D, but the complex points only act in the check. And this factors from F on delta star uh, because G now, from the, by the same computation exactly, is actually the variant under monitor, which equals to C plus one. So you get a map, I don't know, let's call it feed twisted. Or let's call it, uh, should have called it something before, I apologize. <laughs> let's call it G bar. Okay, and now G bar is, again, follows formally from what we did, is, a, is definable. Uh, 
sorry, what is definable map? Well, it is a definable map, but as a result, because this is um, actually a projective, G bar extends to a map from the entire disk to D check. So you can actually extend uh, the map of correspondence to the full bit in the back of five. <clears throat> and for some purposes, studying this um, delta here, this map G uh, on the full disk is enough. Uh, because, I mean, this is now fully a holomorphic map. And for example, for some applications like the functional transcendence, some actual theorems or whatever, um, you, you're, you're, you're perfectly happy to work with this uh, G bar map instead of this map G. Or instead of your map, uh, your, your feet to begin with. Of course, the downside of doing this is you've now lost any kind of interesting structure on D mod G3. So if you want to study any sort of subtlety of the actual um, hard structures, which involves the real structure itself, you can't get it for something like this. So where is G bar definable? No, no, so G bar extends to an actual holomorphic map here. So it's always definable in Rn. No, it's almost never going to be, um, going to be algebraic. I'm trying to think of when we able to break. Yeah, basic, basically never, except some very special cases. Yeah, no, it's typically just some power series. It's like the J function, yeah. which you know you have some power series, and that's what it is. <clears throat> um, okay, you want to say anything else? So in a way, one, one sort of I mean piece of intuition which plays out in, in many ways. Is this n or t equivalent determines or controls how degenerate uh, the variation of hard structures is uh, at zero? Right, because if your monodromy was trivial, then you don't need to do this untwist thing. And this actual map field extends to something on D. And that means you don't degenerate at all. You actually extend. This is equivalent to like have a, a family of elliptic curves. Then uh, if the monodromy and homology around the puncture is trivial, then in fact your elliptic curve family extends over the entire disk. It can be generated without monitoring being present. And it's similar here. If you want to understand sort of how much it's generated, it's really controlled uh, by the action of monitoring, which after going to a finite cover is always going to be in some like unicode here. <clears throat> okay. Um, let me move on. So next time um, I'll start talking about the theory of sort of definable complex analytic spaces. So it's some algebra geometric theory taking omnibility into account, which very much builds on the work with Peter Zill um, and Sterchenko, but wants to sort of add the flexibility um, of, of scheme theory to bear <clears throat> um, in, in, in ways that I'll, that I'll explain. And let me explain the, the motivation for that. Oh, the Griffiths conjecture. So what this says is the following. Once we have this uh, kind of family we talked about before, we get a map from S P mod GZ and the question basically is what does the image of phi of s inside here look like so question what does phi 
¿Qué ves? Ok. Now, Java is analytic. This is an analytic space. This is an analytic space. There are manifolds even. Um, if you look at maps between analytic manifolds without any conditions, they could be quite messy. The image could be some weird constructible thing, it could have some infinite loopy thing, um, all sorts of stuff like that. <clears throat> so one observation um, that's true here is by slightly extending S, you can actually assume phi is proper. What does this mean? Um, of course, in general, phi might not be proper. For example, consider the family of elliptic curves on the modular curve minus a random point inside. Then the map will just be the inclusion from the modular curve minus that random point inside to the full modular curve. That's not proper. But it's sort of proper for a silly reason. It's not proper because you've manually taken out a point. That's not very convincing. And so uh, what, what this step is, is you consider an S inside S bar, you let D be S bar minus S, um, is the union of sort of finitely many irreducible boundary divisors uh, in the boundary. And that around some of them, the monodromy will be trivial. And if the monodromy is trivial, as we just discussed, your map actually extends. So what you can do is you can take S you can add the sort of fake boundary divisors around which your monodromy is trivial. You can show your map phi will extend to those boundary divisors. And now you're just to a point where everything at the boundary has non-trivial monodromy. And then by this kind of study, you can show that the map actually degenerates along all of those boundary components. And that precisely means that this map phi is actually gonna be proper. So this map is not, too bad, topologically speaking. In particular, once you have this being a proper map, P of S actually becomes closed analytic. So that's something. Okay. Observation two is that um, the image comes from S and S has the structure of an algebraic variety. It's not just an analytic. But a priori, this map is some sort of weird identification, right? That identifies points in the ways you don't understand because it's analytic um, and has no, you know, easy to see algebraic structure to it. It turns out though, that's also not true. So the equivalence relation defined by S, defined by phi, excuse me, as a subset of S cross S is algebraic. You can look at pairs of points which map to the same thing, which have the same variation of hard structure, uh, isomorphic variations of hard, isomorphic, sorry, hard structures. Um, a priori, that's an analytic definition. It's something about integrals. Um, but you can show it's algebraic. Why? Well, the reason is because you can look at the period map on S cross S, sorry, mapping to D cross D mod GZ cross GZ. This is nothing interesting. It's just looking at the same period map twice, right? And then inside here, you have the diagonal. The diagonal embedding. And the equivalence relation here is just the pullback of this diagonal along this map. This map is definable, obviously. 
this is definable. Therefore, the pre-image here is also definable in RNX. The same exact argument, you apply definable chow, therefore it's algebraic. So by the Katari de Link Kaplan theorem here, this is a special case of that, if you sort of generalize a little bit. Um, so this is essentially by, by CDK. The Kuhn translation is also algebraic. So now you have a map, proper map, from an algebraic variety into a complex manifold where the equivalent relation is algebraic. You might think that automatically implies that the quotient has an algebraic structure. Um, it turns out that's probably not true. It's certainly not true without some conditions. Um, and we strongly suspect it's not true. We can't actually make a counterexample to this, um, but it turns out that that's, uh, it is naively, a naive stimulus is not true. So does this imply E of S algebraic? Probably not. Now, it might seem like it sort of obviously does because uh, the image is sort of constructible um, and such. The, the problem is that you're not mapping into an algebraic variety. If you're mapping into an algebraic variety, this would all be trivial. Because the, if, the, if the target had some like algebraic structure to begin with, then you could put these together, apply some theorems and, and it'd be that. Uh, but because the structure, the image is just some analytic space, you're essentially asking, can you take quotients of an algebraic variety by an algebraic relation? The answer is typically no, by the way. If you have an algebraic variety of number of relations, there's no reason the quotient exists. Even quotients by group actions don't exist in general. Um, but you might ask if the quotient exists as an analytic space, does it exist algebraically? That's kind of a subtle question. Anyways, it seems like, uh, it seems to us after thinking about this for a long time, the answer is no, though we can't make a counter example. But yes. So what does the question actually mean? Uh, what phi as is some, some subset of this uh, analytic space. Right. Uh, what does it mean to say that it's algebraic? That's a great question. Um, that's a great question. Um, so I'll talk about that in a second. That's part of the question. <laughs> That's part of the question. No. So you can ask, is it algebraizable, for example? Oh, right. Is there any algebraic structure on it? Uh, and you would want the map from S to it to be an algebraic map. <clears throat> but even this question, does it imply it's algebraizable? Is not clear. But that's a great question. What does this mean? So let's talk about it. <clears throat> So anyways, uh, in fact, it is algebraic. <laughs> in fact, C of S is algebraic. The map to it is algebraic. And in fact, it's not algebraic, but it's quasi-projective. Um, now, what does this mean? So in principle, you ask a very good question. And it's kind of an annoying part um, of dealing with these sort of questions. That if you have an analytic variety, what does it mean to put an algebraic structure on it? Well, you could say there's some algebraic variety whose analytification gives you your analytics, analytic variety. But that's a bit unsatisfying because there's often many distinct algebraic structures that give you the same complex manifold. And so you're sort of scrounge around for, for the right one to talk about. In this case, it turns out um, things are better. So note, that phi of s as a subset of d mod z has an rnx structure. You got a canonical structure of an rnx um, uh, manifold. <clears throat> and now that effect implies by definable chow, by definable chow, E of S has 
at most one, most one algebraic structure. inducing its canonical RNX structure. Because if you have two, you would have an isomorphism between them, namely the identity map on the level of being definable and being holomorphic. And by definable child, that would mean it's an algebraic isomorphism as well, right? <clears throat> So given the fact that it has a canonical definable structure, because this is a canonical definable structure and the period map is definable, so now we're using the full force of everything we know, it means there's at most one observation to look for. So now the question makes perfect sense intrinsically. Um, so this is a very nice sort of side effect of definable child theorem, of the definable child theorem. Um, and when we explain generalization of the schemes, uh, you can, you could talk about it not just at level of subsets, but at the level of spaces of, of schemes. So you can include new potent information. Um, you can then ask, are you algebraic in the sort of extremely canonical sense, even if the image uh, where you're working, the ambient space, is not an algebraic variety itself. So given a definable holomorphic manifold, you can look at definable holomorphic subsets of it and ask, are you algebraic? Right? <clears throat> okay. Um, so as a very brief sort of um, guidepost which we're going to do next time, um, we're going to start talking about uh, the proof of this theorem. And essentially the proof of this theorem is going to involve studying exactly this kind of algebraic structures in definable, uh, in definable spaces. Um, and to do that, we'll, we'll, we'll have to start expanding um, our algebraization theorems from sets to information that includes infinite decimals. So we're gonna to have to do some sort of um, definable deformation theory. Um, okay, let me stop here for today. Thank you. <clears throat> any, any questions or from the chat? Great, okay, I'll see you Friday. <clears throat> Yeah, I saw. I will